Issues having to do with blood. We're going to have to zip through this because I'm very mindful of the time because of Fran Django. Poor Fran, he's a great guy, stuck up in Buffalo. Blood cases, possible defenses that are out there. Pre-specimen collection, specimen collection, pre-analytical, meaning storage, analytical, post-analytical. Okay, drawing your attention to this and some highlights that are here. Pre-specimen collection. Okay, where did the kits come from? How many people have actually seen blood kits and blood tubes? Raise your hand. Okay, great. So you guys are familiar with this stuff. So what I'm going to do is pass it around. Feel free to open it up. Take a look at it. Here's some tubes. Okay. And uh, in its contents. What you have to understand is that all tubes are not made the same. Even if there's the same color tube top, it does not have the same components necessarily. This is the gray tube top, the one that we are mostly going to be dealing with. There are uh, additives that are inside of it. There's different enclosures that have to do with the difference of what's called the septum or the top. On the, on the left is a hemoguard. On the right is a rubber septum. Okay, you can take a look and get a lot of information off of these tubes themselves and what they're supposed to have in there. There's a chart right here that you can take a look at your own leisure. It's inside of your materials as far as what it says, the proper draw volume, uh, what it has inside of it, the color coding that represents there. But the most important thing for the gray tube top is to remember not all gray tube tops are equal. And what I mean by that is that this is how you can take a look and see what type of analysis is done too. Gray tube tops have potentially two different additives that are in it. One's an anti-glycotic agent, meaning it stops cellular breakdown. And then the other one is an anti-coagulating uh, uh, salt potassium oxalate or EDTA. As you can see on here, there's different makeups that are there, but most importantly, there's a gray tube top that has only sodium fluoride and does not contain potassium oxalate or an anticoagulant. So you have to just not accept, oh, it's a gray tube top because there's different types of gray tube tops. One of them that's going around there, if you take a look at the label, it'll say sodium fluoride only, it doesn't have potassium uh, oxalate. And that's gonna be important because of clotting. Okay, so not all gray tube tops are the same. It requires eight gentle inversions, which we'll go over here in a minute. So let's take a look at the magic tube and its contents. Okay, buzzing right through, because not everyone has it in front of them. These are the two tubes that come in there. This is the sheath needle, and this is the hub. An exploded view or a closer view of the same exact things. As you can see at the bottom, you can see the additives that are there. You can visually see them. Um, and you can, of course, see the label. This one says potassium oxalate, sodium fluoride. It says 100 milligrams. I think we have, yeah, a better one. 100 milligrams, 10 milliliter draw. That means it has a 1% amount of sodium fluoride that's there. It's going to be important later on. So this is it at the bottom. To give it some scale, that's present. Sometimes you'll get people that will say things like, well, there was nothing inside the tube. Well, thank you. There's nothing inside the tube. There's no potassium fluoride. There's no... Uh, uh, there's no sodium fluoride, no potassium oxalate. Thank you, Miss, Miss, uh, Mr. and Ms. Uh, phlebotomist. You just helped me win my case. Uh, but you should always be able to see that inside the tube. If it's not there, then you know you don't have a great tube top. As I said, there's different fill volumes, and you can see here that there's 30 milligrams, so you can do the math to see that it's not 1%. There's a smaller amount that's there, the hemoguard. This is the septum. One of the most important things that I've been doing lately is going to the lab to examine the septum because I have no life and this is what I love doing. But the purpose behind it is to take a look at the puncture that's there. It should only be punctured one time as we'll see here. And this is the transfer tube as we take a look at it. That's it collected and put together. And the most important thing to drive away from this in a slide here is how it's all assembled. So that's it assembled when it goes into someone's arm. That's what it should look like. But as you can see here, there's only one prick that goes on through the septum that's there. If you see multiple ones, two things happen. Either you know, they did it, well, no matter what, they did it wrong. So you're looking for multiple entries that are there. As you're putting blood in, other things also come in, and contaminants can come in, as we're going to go over here in a minute. OK, so moving right along. Okay. 
it's important to know how much sodium fluoride is there for a magic word that we're going to come back to, and I'm going to mention at least three times in my limited time that I have left with you folks, called Candidus albican. Candidus albican is a yeast. It's, it's omnipresent. It's all over our skins. Not to gross you out, it's, on, it's everywhere. You just can't get away from it. Um, it is, uh, it's omnipresent and everywhere, like I said. But most importantly, you have to know whether or not it's 1% or less than that or 2% because there are studies that are out there that say if you have an insufficient amount of sodium fluoride, it can cause neogeneration of alcohol, meaning alcohol inside the tube that's not your client's fault. So think about that. It will grow alcohol inside the tube that's not your client's fault. That's Candidus albicanum. We're going to come back to that and explain that. So you have to know about the strength of the sodium fluoride. As an aside, very quickly, the different colors of the tube uh, of, the, uh, of the needles has to do with the gauges of the needles that are there. There's no consistency between manufacturers. And the reason why it's important is for this little dealy job that's right here. It's called the butterfly needle. Butterfly needle is used for two particular reasons. Number one, they say for comfort because there's people that have needle phobias and stuff like that. A smaller gauge needle, which is exactly what a butterfly needle is, smaller gauge, when you go and you put it in the person's you know, arm, it's supposed to be you know, not such a traumatic event uh, to them as opposed to a wide board needle, which is what we saw up there. It's, it's very different. The other thing is you know, the phobia that all people are drunk or aggressive and they don't want to be there, and especially because you guys have uh, forced draws in this state. And so uh, forced blood draws. So what they'll do is they'll get some separation between them and the crazy drunk guy by using the, uh, the butterfly needle. The reason why that's important comes down to the good old hose. You have your garden hose, okay? You turn it on. What's it do? It just makes that nice little pretty, you know, lap that goes on there. There's no pressure that goes on there, and it just makes that nice little pool there. If you go and put your thumb on it to restrict the gauge, making it a smaller gauge, what ends up happening, there's your thumb, what ends up happening, is it jets out at a higher concentration faster. The reason why that is important is the tube and the way it fills. So you put on the normal needle, and what ends up happening is it fills up nice and gently, just like that. That's the way you want it to do it, because you want to rupture the red blood cells that are contained within it. If you have the butterfly needle, what ends up happening is it comes jetting in very quickly, just like our thumb example does. And what that can do is lead to what's called Hemolysis. Hemolysis is red blood cell rupturing, especially in enzymatic assay testing. Hospital blood testing spells disaster because what you're doing is you're releasing uh, the red blood cell and, it, and its parts that are there, and it can over-report someone's blood alcohol content just because the nice phlebotomist thought they were doing a favor and doing comfort. That happens. We see that happen a lot where we are. So i got to skip over a couple slides because I only have a couple minutes left and I have a lot to, to talk about here. So the specimen collection, there's a difference, of course, between arterial and, and venous blood. Most of your collections are going to be venous blood. If you have someone who's in the post-absorptive phase, which Dr. Jingle will talk about in, in the physiology that goes on there, you can have, it's a wild guess because you got to remember that with a venous collection, it's basically your waste. It's the stuff that goes to your brain that impairs you not the stuff that comes out of your brain you know, after, after it's been uh, exposed there. A lot of researchers uh, say that it's equivalent to a wild guess. Everything, everything, everything on the planet Earth has an expiration date. And the important thing is the provodone iodine, which is the non-alcoholic uh, swab that's there, that even has an expiration. You just have to know where to look for it. It's at the bottom here, and it's embossed. You have to turn it around, take a look at it. That's what you're looking at. And it, whoops, that's where it says, come on, computer. That's where it says the expiration date. That means that it's good through 12-31-2010. Uh, you don't drink milk that's past its expiration. You don't serve it to your kids. And you don't want your phlebotomist using uh, things that are beyond expiration at all. 